Today, we are going to discuss the general public's opinion of the Detroit Tigers' upcoming season. We're going to take a look at some lines and odds from our friends over at FanDuel. We're also go- then going to player preview the 2024 season for Javi Baez. All today on Locked on Tigers. You are Locked on Tigers, your daily Detroit Tigers podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of Locked On Tigers. I'm, of course, your host, Scott Bentley. Today is Tuesday, March 26th, 2024. Thank you so much for making Locked On Tigers your first listen. Every single day, we are free and available wherever you get your podcast, including YouTube, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on MLB and use code all lowercase locked on MLB for a first deposit match up to $100. All righty. Welcome in everybody. Happy Tuesday to all. Hope you're all having a fantastic week so far. So we're going to take a look at Some odds and lines that FanDuel has set for the Detroit Tigers, the American League, the American League Central, etc. This season, uh, obviously, from the Tigers' perspective. And I think that, you know, this is not betting advice or anything like that. I'm not trying to come across as that being the intent of the show, because it's absolutely not. Um, But I do think it's important. Like, this is a show that I like doing every year, and we've done it for the last couple of preseasons, you know, right before the regular season starts in a row here. And the reason why is just because I think it's important to get an outsider's perspective, right? Whether it's national media, uh, you know, national markets, right? Lines move a little bit based on where money is going, et cetera. So I, I do think that it's important to do this just because I am watching and talking about this team every day. And you are taking in, right, like my content if you're here, obviously, which thank you very much. And you are probably also taking in content from our fantastic beat writers and other podcasts and shows and media personalities and people that cover, you know, radio stations, et cetera. Just all these people that cover the Tigers and and follow them daily. And I think it's important to take a step back and look at, okay, how about the people that aren't like in the trenches and consistently in and around the team or talking about the team or following the team every single day, what do they think? Because I think that that's that's an important perspective to just keep in the back pocket. So we're going to talk about that at the beginning of the show, the first half, and then we will end with the final player preview of our player preview series for the 2024 year, and that is Javi Baez, as promised, the uh, the, uh, last but not least, on our list, and yeah, we're going to discuss all things Javi in 2024, and then we will be completely done with everyone on the 40-man roster in our player preview series, all right? So let's start off by talking about the American League Central. The Detroit Tigers currently on FanDuel, our friends over at FanDuel, have the third best odds to win the American League Central. That is also the third worst odds because there's five teams in the division. So glass, 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 glass half empty, glass half full. You know, you could say it however you'd like, but they are projected to, well, this is not necessarily projected to finish in the middle. Just have the third highest odds at plus 380. The Twins are minus money, so they are pretty heavily favored. And then the Guardians are second with plus 300. So that tells you that the Guardians and the Tigers are relatively close, right? They're they're pretty close in the eyes of kind of where some of this money is going, et cetera. And the Twins are the pretty clear heavy favorite to win the American League Central. Uh, I think it should be a little bit closer, but this is not a projection by any one person. Again, this is just where how everything has kind of formed over the last several weeks since these opened, you know, a few months ago. So uh, I I think that that kind of makes sense. The the general consensus around baseball is that the Twins should be the favorite to win the American League Central. And and clearly uh, the general public is not thinking any differently with a pretty big drop-off from the Twins to the Guardians and us here at second and third. The Tigers overall have a plus 175 to make the postseason. 
This is not bad. Uh, the one thing that I think is weird about that is that would imply that it's more likely for the Tigers to make the postseason period than outright win the division. And I don't think anybody out there uh, believes that the, that any team really in the American League Central is about to get a wild card spot. Now, crazier things have happened. Obviously, they're, they play the games for a reason. We'll see. But I, I would be pretty surprised if any team in the AL Central was represented in wild card fashion. I think we might have a similar situation to last year where the the winner of the AL Central is really the only team that is going to be in the postseason from our just fantastic and competitive division that we find ourselves in. Um, but I found that interesting. Plus 175 for the Tigers to make the playoffs. Let's talk about some lines. This is always a really fun and interesting conversation to have just because it gives you exact numbers, you know, of where around where people think certain statistical categories will end for certain players. So Colt Keith, for instance, his home run total on FanDuel for the 2024 season is 13 and a half. And obviously you're either betting the over or the under. So, you know, I, I, my number is less than 20. I think I was asked recently about over under, it was the Motor City Metrics guys uh, sent out a thing to a lot of the D Detroit Tigers, you know, people that, that cover the team. And one of the numbers on there was Colt Keith home run. And I think it was 17 or 18 on there. And I still took the under on that. Uh, but 13 and a half seems a little bit low. My mindset since he signed, really since last year, was that his rookie year was going to be maybe slow start, catch fire as the season goes along. The power is usually the last to come around. I'm not expecting a 20 home run season out of the kid, but I am expecting around 15. And, and that makes this, you know, around ish where. Uh, my head is at as well, just a little bit lower. So I, I think that that's kind of general ballpark where I'm thinking as well, a little bit higher uh, for me, I guess. Again, not betting advice, not telling you to take the over or anything, but um, I, I think in my viewpoint, a little bit higher for sure. Torkelson, the other one that is represented in these home run totals, 28 and a half, obviously hit 31 home runs last season. So the over under being set at less, at fewer, then he hit a season ago. Part of that may just be he played in 160 games last year. You know, <laughs> I mean, if if he even misses a week, that'll be more than he's ever missed, uh, at least due to injury. So maybe some of it has to do with that, just the uh, an expectation that he won't play every single game pretty much again for the second year in a row. But uh, I do find that interesting that it was a that it's a, a, a an actual step back from only by three. But it is less than what he did last year. He's a former number one overall pick who read a really hot second half of the season. If anything, I expected it to be maybe at the same or even a little bit more than what he ended at last season. But I also think that anything around 30 is probably fair game for, you know, if I was to walk up and just ask you how many home runs do you think Torque's going to hit this year? Uh, I know some people are really bullish and, and are saying, you know, 40. Uh, but I think the most people, if you were to average that number out, you'd probably get a number around 30, which is what he did, obviously, a season ago. So um, you also have just players to hit 30-plus home runs. You have two Tigers represented here. Spencer Torkelson, plus 104. And Colt Keith also made the cut for this, plus 870. So obviously, I think it's a, it's a pretty big long shot for Keith to join the 30-home run club as a rookie. I think that that's probably fair. Torkelson technically not favored to do so. Again, obviously his line being 28 and a half, but really, really close. Again, 28 and a half. So I think that that is, is all probably pretty fair as well. Let's get into the pitching side of things. Tarek Skubal, there's a lot of fun numbers with him. Uh, Jack Flaherty makes an appearance here. Uh, we have some awards to go over, not only on the position player and, and pitching side of things, not only the playing Goodness, not only the player side of things, my goodness, but also in manager of the year. AJ Hinch, we'll just say not bad odds to win AL manager of the year. We'll get into all of that right after this. 
Got to talk to you all today about our friends over at Prize Picks. Football season may be over, but the action on the floor is heating up. Whether it's tournament season or the fight for playoff home court, there's no shortage of high stakes basketball moments this time of year. So get in on the excitement with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app where you can turn your hoops knowledge into serious cash. You can now win up to 100 times your money on Prize Picks with as little as four. Correct picks. You can turn $10 into $1,000 with NBA, NHL, and college basketball entries today on Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app. There are always so many fun uh, players to look at when talking about Prize Picks, right? You basically look at the stats and the players that you're selecting, and you choose more or less on certain stats. So, for instance, Pascal Siakam, more or less than eight rebounds tonight, Monday night. You will already know the results of this. I really like more on that. And then Kyrie Irving, 10 rebounds plus assists. I like more on that as well. So just some fun, you know, basketball, really important time of year as we talked about. And uh, always some fun players to get in on the action there. Obviously, tournament season. As well. So download the app today and use code locked on MLB for a first deposit match up to $100. It's locked on MLB for a first deposit match up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. All right, everybody, welcome back here. Segment two of Locked on Tigers. Appreciate y'all for tuning in and making us your first listen every day. Shout out to the everydayers that do tune in every day. We will be back tomorrow talking about the last spring training game as well as starting to get hyped and turn our attention to Thursday right around the corner. Just got to make it to Thursday. Also, be sure to check out Locked On Sports Today, a free 24-7 sports streaming channel program for your everyday to give you the biggest stories without all the screaming that maybe Fox and ESPN provide all day Every day. So check out Locked On Sports Today, streaming 24 7 on YouTube or for free in the Amazon Fire TV channels app. Okay, let's talk about pitching. So, some interesting pitching lines and totals here. Really easy to start with. Just Cy Young, Tarek Skubal, fifth, fifth highest odds according to FanDuel to take home. The Cy Young Award at plus 1,000 that comes with a lot of other interesting numbers as well, including uh, plus 330 for him to record a 200 or more strikeout season. It's really not bad, all things considered. Uh, obviously, most of that is just good. I'll put it this way. If Tarek Skubal stays healthy, does not find himself on the IL for a large amount of time at any point, he's hitting 200. It's just a matter of, how many innings are we going to get out of Tarek Skubal? Obviously, that's been a shaky conversation for most of his major league career. So that's how I'll put that. But I, I just seeing a Tiger so high up in all of the pitching side of things and all these conversations with pitching odds and lines and whatnot, it's just so refreshing and new feeling and and nice and cool and other adjectives that fall into that category as well just really really awesome to see an old english d and see scoobles name so high on all of the pitching awards and whatnot uh jack flaherty making an appearance not for american league cy young odds or anything but uh they have set his strikeout total at 134 and a half i think a lot of that not surprisingly, is also going to come down to what, how many innings is this dude going to give us when it's all said and done. But a lot of people obviously very optimistic about what they have seen from Flaherty so far in spring training. Tarek Skubal's strikeout number is 170 and a half. You can also plus 3,200 just to straight up lead the league. In strikeouts, uh, those are pretty hefty, right? That that's, <laughs> uh, FanDuel is very convinced that that's probably not going to happen with those high of odds. But 170.5. Man, it's just so easy to say, well, if he's healthy, he'll pass that. But that is kind of like where I'm at. Like it, it, this, I, I can't predict injuries, dog, right? Like I, I can't, can't predict who's going to get hurt and who's going to pitch a full season and whatnot or else I'd be a doctor, which I'm very notoriously not. So 
I, you know what I mean? If he's healthy, yeah, he's probably going to blow past 170. It's just a matter of how many innings we get out of him. Just which really is kind of like that with all pitchers, which is why uh, pitching strikeout totals are always an interesting conversation in that regard because it, especially in today's day and age with all the injuries that happen on the pitching side of things, that's kind of what it always comes down to. So, um, but I, I think that 170 and a half is uh, is a pretty interesting number there. Uh, MVP. Spencer Torkelson, Riley Green at plus 20,000. There's one more Tiger that's tied with them at plus 20,000. That's the lowest odds they offer for people that made the cut here. I'd like you to guess. Just say out loud. Who do you think the third Tiger is? You're wrong. It's Javier Baez. Somehow has the same odds to win MVP as Spencer Torkelson and Riley Green, which is hilarious, uh, but plus 20,000. If you want, if you're really confident in the Javi Baez bounce back season, Tarek Skubal, like I said earlier, fifth place to win Cy Young, Corbin Burns, uh, Gaussman, Castillo, and Pablo Lopez, the top four, Skubal fifth, Framber Valdez sixth, rookie of the year, Colt Keith, fourth highest odds to win the American League rookie of the year, Parker Meadows, sixth highest odds at plus 2,500, Colt Keith at plus 1,000. It's just really cool to see two just not only two people from the same team in general, but two Detroit Tigers, both in the top six for odds for American League Rookie of the Year. I think that that's pretty cool to see as well. And then we'll end on Manager of the Year. Plus 550, the best odds in baseball. The person that FanDuel has as the betting favorite to win American League Manager of the Year is your very own AJ Hinch. I think this kind of makes sense. People are are nationally starting to get a little bit more bullish on the Tigers and uh the, the starting to catch wind, I think, through the the good spring and whatnot. And I do think that manager of the year is pretty much just most improved team award, if we're being honest, or maybe I shouldn't put it that way, uh, most exceeded expectations award. And so if people think that the Tigers are going to actually be players in the American League Central, then it makes sense that A.J. Hinch would be also just for notoriety. He's a big name, obviously, with his past for better or for worse. Um, Okay, let's get into, we'll end this conversation with win totals. The Tigers, 80 and a half is their win total, and they are minus 128 to win over 80 games. Minus money for the Tigers to win over 80 games And their win total being right at, obviously, like I said, 80 and a half. We'll get to my Thursday's episode, opening day, will be where we just lay out expectations from the season. I'll give an exact record. We can talk all about, you know, the ins and outs of of what I want to see from the Detroit Tigers this season. That'll be, like I said, Thursday's episode. But 80 and a half, I think think we're talking, you know, barely, barely over. Basically, just say, are they going to go over under 500? You're a game off there, obviously, but same uh, same premise, right? Uh, I think that that is uh, kind of a unique way of uh, of putting the line. I think that's probably a good idea. I think that's a good line. I'll take a, just a hair over. That's where my mind is at. And again, it's good to see that where my mind is at is not too terribly far off, really, with any of these than what kind of the market is being set at and what the general public thinks of your Detroit Tigers, okay? We're done with that conversation. Let's talk hobby bias. We'll do all of that right after this. Got to talk to you all today about our friends over at FanDuel. We've been talking about FanDuel all episode, obviously, and you can say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tourney. Whether you're betting on the big upset or a one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book right now. New customers can get $200 in bonus bets. If your first $5 bet wins, that's 200 bucks to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. All right, everybody, welcome back here. Third and final segment of Locked on Tigers. Appreciate you all so much for tuning in. As always, let's talk Javi Baez. Uh, I definitely like way overhyped this whole conversation. I actually don't think that this is really a long conversation or a difficult conversation to have. I think we're kind of all in the same boat. Uh, It's just anytime there's any conversation 
surrounding Javi Baez, it just turns into this big brouhaha and everybody starts getting mad and angry and yelling. And I, I understand the frustration. He is set to get paid $25 million each of the next this year and next year, each of the next two seasons, and then $24 million the two years after that. He is not off the books until 2027. So where does that leave us? Obviously, no one's happy with his performance. I'm sure he is not happy with his performance since joining the Detroit Tigers. I want to start with outside of the batter's box. I want to start with defense, space running, really anything else you can think of outside of just straight up hitting, which we will talk plenty about. Okay. Last season, he ranked in the 95th percentile in range. That is amongst the best in baseball. That's in the top 5% of the league in terms of range, right? That's mostly what OAA is trying to find. How many balls can you get to in your position? Defensive run saved. Doesn't like him nearly as much as OAA does. And there are some people that like one stat, like the other, etc. Aside from that, okay, he gets to a lot of baseballs. That is good. Two thumbs up. That's a that's a very uh, valuable skill and one that, especially at shortstop, is going to be very, very important. It's the only reason he's somehow managed to have a positive war over the last couple of years with his offense being as poor as it is. The flip side of that, Commits a ton of errors. Last season had 19 errors. In 2022, had 26 errors. And in 2021, had 20 errors. More than half of them in each of those years are obviously throwing errors, as we've become accustomed to. It's one of the reasons why Spencer Torgelson's range and ability to make plays you know, on balls hit in the field at first base is, I don't want to say overlooked, because it's not overlooked. We talk about it a lot. Um, but you you give it a pass sometimes because you are aware of how valuable Torgelson's ability to scoop the baseball at first base is because Javi has a, an erratic arm. It is it is all over the place consistently, right? So that is the defense. Really good range, but a lot of errors, <laughs> like towards the top of baseball in any position. Total in errors. Each of the last three years, he's been towards the top or at the top. Okay, so not awesome. Uh, could be worse. Does give you defensive value. Absolutely. It's not like he is just, you know, completely not valuable at all on the defensive side of the ball. Okay, don't want to don't want to make that how it sounds. He, he has value. It just, you know, like e even his defense, the, the thing that he's the best at, even that it's like, yeah, but. It's like, yeah, that is the thing he's the most valuable at, but he also commits, you know, some of the most errors in the entire game of baseball each of the last two seasons. So that's frustrating. Base running, he's a pretty good base runner. Uh, I, I would say kind of consistently throughout his career, above average base runner, solid sprint speed, whatever. He's not going to go out there and steal 30 plus bases. Uh Part of that is just getting on first with nobody ahead of him consistently enough, but also just at this point, his career not going to be a huge base dealer, even with the new rules. Um, so that leaves us to hitting, and that leaves us to the final part of his profile here. And then we will talk kind of big picture and, and all that that everybody wants to talk about, you know, where he stands with the team this season. So he was one of the worst hitters in baseball last year. We can just call it what it is, dog. Uh, 222 average, 267 OBP is just catastrophic. Uh, and even worse, maybe, is a 325 slug. That is a 592 OPS. He was slightly better against lefties than righties. He had a 659 OPS against lefties. Uh, that is a 79 OPS plus. So still 21% worse than league average. Uh, righties a 571 OPS, just remarkably bad. Um, I mean, we don't have to go through the percentiles. It's not good in anything. Uh, chasing more than anybody in the entire game of baseball, first percentile there, whiffing a boatload, walking never. You know the drill, okay? Everyone's aware of Javi's approach at the plate. The weird thing is last year, he was actually towards like right around league average and strikeout rate. Um, and he's always going to go viral and get a lot of heat for chasing out of the zone, which he should. The thing is, a lot of those, he 
again, it's funny, haha, when he swings and misses, and he swings and misses plenty. 12 percentile and whiff rate. Not trying to make it sound like he doesn't swing and miss and chase out of the zone. And he does a lot. That is his whole thing. Um, but he he also chases out of the zone and and it makes contact with a lot. It's just really weak, uncompetitive contact, and a lot of them are just rollovers. 42nd percentile in K rate. Kind of surprising, right? Not something that given, you know, you watch an at bat or two of his, not something that you'd necessarily expect um, to, for him, his strikeout numbers to be around, around league average, but I'm um, still striking out plenty. Again, don't get it twisted, 22.9%. But um, I think that this has led to the conversation of, you know, everybody loves to ask, how do you fix it? Or what does he have to do? Let me get one thing just really out in the open. And we talked about this at nauseum last season. Okay. So if you listened to the show last year, you know what I'm about to say. And, and I appreciate you for your support on, you know, a dating at least a year ago, because I, if, <laughs> if you've heard this before, that that's how long you've been listening. So but he has been good with this approach before. He has been really good. He's been MVP caliber good with this approach. He's been getting clowned on for swinging at sliders and curveballs in the other batter's box since he was, you know, in 2015-16, when he was, you know, a rookie first few years in baseball. And has gotten MVP votes before. So what has changed to make this approach that has always been not, it's always been aggressive and free swinging, go from, you know, 813 OPS in 2021, two seasons removed from the 592 a year ago. The simple thing is that we talked about a lot last year was he just cannot hit fastballs anymore. And again, I think it's a bat speed thing. I think part of it is, uh, or, or maybe a large part of it, I should say, is an inability to catch up with the baseball. But the fact of the matter is, no matter what your theory is as to why, uh, last season he had a 204 average and a 282 slug against fastballs, all variations of. His breaking and off-speed stuff obviously has fluctuated throughout his career. And when, again, when he was, you know, crushing the ball and whatnot and, and he was getting MVP votes, they were certainly, especially the slugging, better. But, like, he has breaking ball seasons in here. 2016, 232 average, 344 against all breaking balls, right? Like, it, it's it, the, the denominator here that we are talking about, the biggest factor in my eyes is a complete inability to hit fastballs anymore. 2021 had a 487 slug and a 267 average against fastballs. Uh, 2019, 516 slug. 2018, 566 slug. 2017, 523 slug. This is not slugging percentage as a whole. This is just against fastballs. The biggest difference is that. So. You can obviously join in on the laughter and point and go, oh my goodness, he just swung in another slider in the other batter's box. And I will be just as frustrated as anybody because it's impossible not to be because it always just, that's the highest paid player on the team. And he's swinging at balls that are two feet out of the strike zone, right? I, I understand it. And I agree with you. I'm not disagreeing that his approach is whack. Okay. I'm not. My point is there is a version of Javi. That is a good hitter with that approach still that we have all seen in, in the last 10 years. And the biggest difference is, is he just cannot hit fastballs anymore. And that is why I've talked about it in the spring. You know, ability to turn on fastballs. We talked about it a lot last season, and I'm going to keep talking about it this year. What is he doing against fastballs? Because if there's any chance of this dude putting together a remotely decent season, it's going to start and maybe end but at least start with an improved improved numbers and improved effectiveness against fastballs. I just said the word fastball about 60 times. We can move on and talk about what I expect from him this year. I don't expect him to do any of what I just said, okay? So if you were mad and you were like, oh, like, he's not going to do this, though. Like, this, <laughs> this dude doesn't always talk to you about I agree with you, okay? So glad we got that out of the way. 
I have seen nothing in spring training that has led me to believe that Javi Baez is going to turn a corner and start having a 500, 480, 450 slug against fastballs again. Um, and we know the approach on non-fastballs. We know that the effectiveness on non-fastballs. Now, I will say, I don't expect a 592 OPS. And that's not even like faith in, you know, the, the fact that he's going to turn it around or anything. That is just so remarkably low. Like that is, again, he was one of, if not the worst qualified hitter in baseball for most of the season last year. Um, I would really like to believe that he won't be literally the worst hitter in baseball. Um, but that being said, we know it's on the table. We know that that's possible. Nine home runs. In 2021, he had a 30 home run season. In 2023, two years later, he had a nine home run season. Okay. The fall off, we're all aware of. It's well documented. You're all angry. Okay. You have every right to be. I understand. We just talked about the player himself. As far as what I expect out of him, um, I expect him to be on the team throughout all of this season. I don't expect him to get, you know, cut or or DFA'd or something at any point. Um, at the end of the day, you can be mad about it, and I will understand being mad about it. I understand, okay? I understand. But it's a money game. I don't think Chris Illich is going to eat that much money to get him off the baseball team with four years left and, and that much money that he would have to pay him lump sum to get that done. I, I don't see that happening. Now, I do think for the first time ever that we are actually in, we're starting the conversation. I don't think it's happening, but I do think that if he has a 570 OPS in, in the end of May, that we are finally going to start looking around and going, how much longer can we actually do this? How much longer is this justifiable? If the OPS starts with the number six, I hate to break it to you. I don't think he's going anywhere, and that's just going to be that. But if if he somehow, if that OPS somehow gets gets worse than it was a year ago, I think we do finally open the door for that conversation. Don't think it's going to happen, but I think that we can at least start that that convo. Okay, so to recap. I understand your frustration. I agree. I'm frustrated too that the highest paid player on the team and and the the, the parting gift from the previous regime and and all of all of the thoughts you have. I am a fan first as well, and I completely understand. I think we've talked about if there is any hope for a turnaround, what it's going to be involving, and that's going to be the effectiveness against the fastball. Um, there are serious limitations on the heights that he can reach because of the approach and, and all of that at this point in his career. That's pretty much all I got. I expect the OPS to start with the number six. Uh, I don't, ex and that, you know, that could be 615. I'm not saying that's good, um, but, uh, but a 592 is remarkable. And I, I think really the biggest conversation that the fan base wants to have is not even really about the player profile anymore which is why I, I immediately said, I don't think any of that's going to happen though. The, the improvements on the fastballs, et cetera. I think most people are kind of in the boat where it's just like, what is the bar? You know, what, what's the limit we can reach before this becomes like egregious to continue throwing him out there. I think that by in the second half of the year, if he, again, if he's got a 580, 590 OPS, we could start talking about him getting a lot less playing time. We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. I'm I'm hoping for improvements on the fastballs. I'm hoping for some less, some fewer errors. I'm hoping for maybe some some swing adjustments. Uh, his mechanics are are just kind of all over the place, but they've been what he's done his whole career, and they've worked before for him. So I I don't know, I don't know how much those are going to change. We'll see. But I I have I have not seen anything in the spring that I don't think anyone has seen anything in the spring that leads anybody to believe that this year is going to be a whole lot different for Javi.
but they play the games for a reason. We'll see. Let's think uh, happy thoughts. We'll turn our eyes to Thursday. Thanks for making Locked On Tigers your first listen every single day. Shout out to the everydayers that do tune in every day. We will be back tomorrow. Um, I do think that the team can be competitive, like with him on the, like, I don't know. I see some takes that are like, you know, Javi, uh, like the Tigers can't win with him at shortstop or like can't be a really good team with him at shortstop. He's not a negative 10 win player, right? Like this dude is, the Tigers can still have a really fun and good season, um, but he's going to be a talking point throughout it all. And that is pretty self-explanatory as to why. Highest paid player on the team and has not performed as such since putting on the old English D. So, um, yeah, we'll see what happens. I get it. I think that's it. I- I'm again, I'm, I'm just trying to make sure I got all my thoughts out. But I think I'm just talking at circles at this point. So I'm going to let you go. Peace and love going to therapy's dope. I will catch y'all tomorrow, baby. Go Tigers.